Okay, thank you everyone for coming back and welcome to the last session of day one for the uh, our third annual client onboarding forum. Um, so, of course, you know, a big, big welcome to Donald Green from Innovatrix, in which uh, they are one of our supporters as well. They are one of our sponsors. Uh, again, just reminding you, please go to the sponsors tab. Please do go check out Innovatrix's sponsor booth as they do have some really good innovations at the minute, you know, goes with the name a little bit there. Um, but no, I would like to uh, welcome Donald, um, who is the Chief Experience Officer for Digital Onboarding there at Innovatrix. Um, so Donald today is going to be speaking on the core technology enabling secure remote onboarding. Uh, so I will pass you over now to Donald. Uh, I welcome you to the stage, Donald. I very much look forward to hearing your presentation. Yes, Liam, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the introduction <clears throat> and also well done today on an excellent, uh, excellent day of, of sessions. Uh, hopefully this last session will be equally as, as interesting as some of the other ones. And we look forward to day two, of course. Um, no, thank you. Sure. <laughs> I'll also stop my video just for, for bandwidth considerations and share screen. And then I'll come back on afterwards with uh, questions and answers. So sharing screen. Okay, so um, as Liam mentioned, I'm, I'm the Chief Experience Officer for Digital Onboarding at Innovatrix. Um, the presentation I'm going to present today will cover the core technology which enables secure remote onboarding. Uh, Prashant gave a very interesting and insightful interview uh, overview of, of what MasterCard are doing in this space. So in this presentation, I think we'll dive a little bit deeper into one or two of the parts that he mentioned in his presentation and uh, talk about some of the technical considerations. And I'll also try and end the presentation with three or four tips uh, of just general things to keep in mind if you're uh, a bank or an organization uh, which is evaluating vendors for onboarding technology. Uh, before we go into it, I'll just give a short 30 second overview of Innovatrix uh, in case any of you are unfamiliar with us. We're a biometric technology company. Uh, we've started out uh, working 16 years ago with fingerprint algorithms. And in the last four or five years, four or five years moved more into the uh, AI driven part of biometrics with iris and facial recognition. And our technology is used by governments and enterprises uh, all over the world. Uh, like, like I said, we've been around for 16 years. We employ 130 people across our uh, global offices. So our HQ is in Bratislava in Slovakia. We have research and development in the Czech Republic and then local offices in the USA, Brazil, Taiwan, and Singapore. Over those 16 years, we've managed to successfully complete uh, 500 projects in more than 80 countries, and more than 1 billion people have been enrolled using our technology. So that's about one in seven people in the world have been processed using Innovatrix technology in one way or another. So when we take biometrics and apply it to onboarding, uh, I think even in the last three years, which is when I got involved in, in uh, biometrics on onboarding, we've come a long way. Uh, we've worked with a number of customers implementing this technology, and it's taken us from scenarios like this, if we think about the banking use case, where a bank onboarding consists of uh, either calling or emailing a bank clerk to set up a meeting, uh, taking a, a, a car or transportation to your nearest bank branch, showing all of your documentation, getting it verified, signing the uh, various agreements, usually uh, tens or dozens of pages. And <clears throat> we've benchmarked that this takes about 43 minutes and the uh, direct cost to the uh, bank or to the company who's onboarding the customer is about 147 euros. So from that scenario, uh, a couple of years ago, we've moved very quickly into this scenario, which is uh, you want to onboard, you simply grab your smartphone, you scan your ID card, you take a selfie, you tap yes to open an account, and within four minutes at a six euro direct cost, uh, you're onboarded. By the way, this data is benchmarked by our customer, which is Europe's second largest uh, retail bank. Uh, <clears throat> this customer and others use our technology, which is called Digital Onboarding Toolkit. Uh, digital Onboarding Toolkit is basically a set of components which either the end users or system integrators use uh, to integrate into their onboarding applications, and it handles the identity verification step, so proving the person is who they claim to be. Uh, some of the bigger brands who have been using our technology over the last couple of years are uh, Home Credit, who have more than 130 million customers in 10 countries. In Telco, we have O2 and Vodafone. In retail banking, Erste Group, 
Uh, in the Middle East, we have Saudi Aramco, who are by some and many measures, the largest company in the world. And also Karim, uh, which is the, the Uber of the Middle East and which recently actually got acquired by Uber themselves. Uh, you'll notice I use the buzzword at uh, these uh, conferences where technology is uh, at the forefront, the word AI powered or the buzzword AI powered is very commonly used. Uh, for me, it's become more of a marketing term than a technical term, but let's take a look at how AI powered or in our case, machine learning uh, has helped us to solve the problems associated with identifying people on the onboarding process. So it solves, I think, the three critical problems with identity in onboarding. Uh, the first question or the first challenge we have is, is the ID card of the person onboarding genuine or is it a fake? The second one is, is the selfie uh, genuine or is it a so-called presentation attack? And the third one is, is the person taking the selfie the same person on the ID card? So we look at how machine learning has helped us to overcome these, uh, these challenges in onboarding. And we start with the first one. So the ID card, uh, is it genuine or fake? Of course, I, I'm not sure if any of you are experienced uh, doc document examiners, but you probably don't need to look too hard to understand and see that these documents are probably uh, fake ones. <clears throat> the, the one on the bottom left with Will Smith is probably the best example of a fake. Uh, you can see it's got most of the security features you'd expect on an ID card. And probably if it wasn't Will Smith, uh, if it was some other person, uh, you'd likely expect that it's a real ID card. Uh, the, the prevalence of fake IDs in the last number of years has, has, uh, has grown. And it's quite easy now to get a very high quality fake ID online <clears throat> of the quality that would even probably challenge a document inspector to be able to tell uh, just by looking at it if it's fake or not. So in this part of the of the three uh, three piece onboarding puzzle, I would say we need to be the most realistic in terms of what technology, uh, particularly computer vision technology, can actually do. Um, so I'll start by saying that there's no magic solution. Uh, I've not seen a solution on the market today uh, which can, with any high degree of accuracy, detect a high quality fake document. So currently, all we can do is add in some let's say clever control steps uh, during the, the document scanning process to pick up on things which may be indicative of tampering on documents like uh, uh, pictures being stuck over the original ones or letters being tampered with. This is possible, but things like really validating uh, security features, holograms, et cetera. Unfortunately, uh, as we stand today with a, with a smartphone camera, this really isn't possible. But this helps. Uh, there are some things we can do. Um, we've learned and added these features to our technology over the last couple of years based on feedback from, from the customers who use it. Uh, the first thing we've added uh, is it's called document auto capture. So we've removed the actual ability in some cases for, for customers to take the document capture themselves using their camera. Rather, they open their camera and we have a neural network which, which runs a quality check, positioning check, uh, lighting, etc. Uh, check on the document and only captures it when it's reached a sufficiently high quality for processing. And what this does is, is this removes a huge amount of poor quality images being sent for processing uh, and this can, this can help to uh, deter or uh, detect fake documents. The second thing we do is uh, custom template training. Uh, we don't have a universal algorithm for all documents. Rather, we take each individual document and document version which needs to be supported by our technology and we uh, train a custom template using deep learning techniques uh, to recognize this document. And this gives us more accuracy in uh, deciding if the document is likely to be uh, real or a fake. I mentioned some feasible authenticity checks. Um, I, I highlight the word feasible because I, 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 do, I really wanna stay away from overstating what's possible using a smartphone camera. In general, what we can do is, as I've mentioned, uh, detecting tampering. Also doing things like uh, age and gender detection. So if the person on the uh, document should be a 35 year old male, uh, we can use some biometric techniques to run uh, age and gender detection on the face, uh, on the ID card to make sure that this adds up. Uh, and also some sum checks with uh, machine readable zones or with uh, 3D or 2D barcodes, which can be, um, which can be uh, present on these documents. Uh, Prashant mentioned in his presentation, uh, NFC chips. Uh, so using the NFC capabilities of a smartphone uh, to validate the chip on a document where possible, this helps a lot. And this is probably the closest you can get to really authenticating the, the, 
uh, the genuine, uh, whether a document is genuine or fake, with the exception of possibly a government database integration, uh, which is probably the ultimate way to, uh, to ascertain if a document is fake or indeed real. The second challenge that we'll uh, discuss or uh, give some insight into is uh, in this new emerging area of uh, what's called liveness detection. So basically, is the person taking the selfie uh, actually taking it of themselves or are they using some presentation attack technique to try and spoof a system? Um, in order to combat this, we've uh, developed two different approaches. Uh, they're so-called active liveness and passive liveness. Active liveness was our first attempt at solving this problem, and it's effective to, an, to, to a point, especially against more basic spoofing attempts. Um, but as you'll see, it, it is something which could be uh, spoofed relatively easily with some effort. So our initial approach to this was, uh, as you can see on this uh, image, there's a randomly moving red dot uh, moving across the screen. And after the user took their selfie, they were asked to follow this dot with their eyes and the uh, algorithm checked the position of the eyes in relation to the dot and was able to see if their eyes were actually moving in this random sequence. So this was the first approach and we, we still use this approach with some customers, but usually we, we pair it up with the so-called and more advanced uh, passive liveness. So the, the, the active liveness is enough for these uh, cheap fakes, let's say, uh, basically sticking a, a image of somebody else over your own face and trying to onboard. This is what passive liveness is good at detecting. Um, but as you'll see in the video I'm going to show you, we've moved now from the era, era of cheap fakes into uh, deep fakes. So let me just play this video for about 10 or 15 seconds. Dear fellow scholars, this is Two Minute Papers with Dr. Karo Jona Ifahir. It is important for you to know that everybody can make deep fakes now. You can turn your head around, mouth movements are looking great, and eye movements are also translated into the target footage. And of course, as we always say, two more papers down the line and it will be even better and cheaper than this. Okay, so I think that's a pretty uh, scary overview of what's possible now using uh, deepfake technology. And obviously something like uh, an active liveness approach would be exposed to this type of uh, deep fake. This is why we've developed uh, using our deep learning techniques and our research and development team in Brno, our so-called passive liveness check. Passive liveness check pretty much in every parameter is uh, more effective than an active liveness check. Uh, obviously it's much more secure. Uh, it's trained on, on deep learning with uh, hundreds, or hundreds and thousands of data points. Uh, to recognize these types of uh, deep fakes and uh, 3D masks and other types of presentation attacks. So the security is improved, but what's also interesting is that the user experience is much better. As you can see in the, in the GIF on the right, the person onboarding, uh, simply in the same time as they take their selfie, uh, there's, a, there's a passive liveness check uh, carried out uh, in, in real time. And what this results is that in, in our customers who have uh, moved from active liveness to passive liveness, the completion of the step, uh, so the lack of drop off at that step has improved from 63% uh, to 99%. And the final point on liveness check is that uh, particularly in passive liveness, there are now some uh, independent standards uh, and organizations which evaluate these, algorithm, evaluate these algorithms, carry out some tests, spoof attacks, and uh, they don't certify them, but they, they say they're compliant with the ISO uh, 3107-3, which is uh, presentation attack detection. So the main organization carrying out these evaluations is IBEDA. They're a certified testing lab in Boulder, Colorado, and they carry out level one and level two presentation attack detection. So the advice I'd give is that if you're implementing uh, this type of uh, technology to look out for the IBEDA a quality assurance mark to make sure this has been tested. For example, our technology was submitted to 1,800 spoofing attacks. And in order to get the compliance, you're not, you're not allowed to let even one of the attacks through your system. So it's quite a, quite a high standard of, of evaluation. The third question or the third challenge with uh, remote onboarding from an identity perspective is uh, proving that it's the same person. So a biometric match or a so-called biometric verification. And it can be quite, quite tricky. If you can see from the, 
the image of my driver's license on the left. Uh, it's got a lot of security features across the face, uh, which can sometimes obscure it. There's also a hologram here on the bottom right side of my chin, which can in uh, bad lighting also obscure the face. Uh, and also people age, people grow beards, people shave their hair, all sorts of different things can, can change their appearance. So it's important to have an algorithm in place which, uh, which is able and robust to, to manage these types of challenges. Um, and with that in mind, I would say that uh, all algorithms are not equal and some are more unequal than others. Uh, and in this, <clears throat> another, another interesting or, or useful thing for people selecting vendors is that like liveness detection in facial biometrics, there is a really long established uh, international benchmark of these algorithms, uh, which are used in these types of use cases. So the international benchmark is called the NIST facial recognition vendor test. NIST is the American National Institute for Standards and Technology, and they run these testing. It's an ongoing test. Anybody can enter. In the most recent evaluations, more than 200 organizations have been evaluated, uh, evaluated the accuracy of their uh, biometric algorithms. And they test broadly in two categories, uh, one to one, which is the most relevant for the onboarding use case. It's so-called verification and one to N, which is still relevant to onboarding. And it's something I see as being more relevant going forward, which I'll mention afterwards. It's quite easy to uh, evaluate if, if uh, a vendor has been evaluated by NIST. You simply go to the NIST website and you'll see a list of all the submissions. Um, this, this list here is the, the so-called leaderboard. So it's the top 30 uh, biometric uh, face one-to-one -one verification algorithms as measured by NIST. This was updated in January, 2021. So it's very up-to-date. Um, and the interesting thing is that from all the uh, vendors on the top 30, only these ones are commercially available for onboarding uh, technologies. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that you need to have a vendor who's top ranked by NIST in the top 30. That's probably overkill for the use case that we're looking at. But it's important to understand if they've been ranked by NIST at all and where they stand in those rankings. So that's the NIST one to one verification. Uh, I'll mention now the NIST one to N verification which is one to many, so-called one to many. And this is what I see as maybe an interesting trend in digital onboarding, where many organizations are moving away from just wanting to evaluate the face of the selfie versus the face of the ID card. Rather, they're interested in evaluating the face of the ID card and the selfie against all the other faces they have in their database, which can run into the millions. And this is where uh, having an algorithm which is ranked in the NIST uh, facial recognition vendor test one to N is very useful because this measures both speed and accuracy. Uh, the accuracy is along the, uh, sorry, the speed is along the bottom here and the accuracy is on the, on the left side. And uh, we, we've, we've been quite successful in the most recent uh, evaluation of this. We've been among the top five or six most accurate algorithms. But most importantly, when we think about uh, large scale search, we've been the fastest from all uh, 200 plus submissions. So to give you an idea of the speed we're talking about, that means finding the right face in a database of 12 million in just 13 milliseconds. Okay, so uh, having mentioned the, the three main questions or the three main problems that can be solved by AI powered algorithms in the onboarding mix, um, I'll now mention a couple of use cases and some interesting statistics we have from, from two customers. Um, the first customer I've mentioned earlier is called Home Credit. Uh, they're a company based in the Czech Republic with operations in 10 countries. And we've delivered digital onboarding technology to them in the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Kazakhstan. Uh, what this amounts to is 20 million onboardings annually. They're using the previous use case that I mentioned as one to end search. So they're actually searching all the new onboarding customers against their existing database of onboardings. Uh, to ascertain if the people have onboarded under different identities or if they're on some exclusion lists or if they're known fraudsters and these type of things. Um, so the result for home credit is that an onboarding on average takes three minutes from start to finish. And they've reported a 90% uh, fraud rate drop since they've implemented this in early 2019. More close to home, a uh, use case from inside Europe is uh, our customer in Slovakia, Tatrabanka, which is a member of Raffaizen Bank International. Um, they've implemented, they were actually our first customer who implemented this digital onboarding technology. I believe it was somewhere in 2018. Um, and they, they, they've, they've got a reputation for being an innovator uh, in, in banking in Slovakia. They were the first bank to introduce voice biometrics many years ago. 
and they were the first in the market to introduce uh, biometrics for for onboarding. Um, their fastest reported uh, onboardings, uh, they, they've used it for two use cases, for new accounts and for new loans. So in new accounts, they've managed to onboard a customer in three minutes and seven seconds, and they've managed to approve a new loan for a customer in eight minutes and eight seconds. Uh, probably more interesting is that the, since they've implemented this in 2018, uh, now 50% of all new accounts are open remotely and automatically. And by the way, this data was before uh, the COVID pandemic, so I'm sure that it's probably above 80% at the moment, uh, given the situation. So just coming to wrap up the presentation, um, I, I would maybe leave you with four key points if you're going to be evaluating vendors of uh, onboarding solutions. It's important to understand the core technology that's inside, whether you uh, get your solution from uh, a platform vendor who, who brings together more parts of the onboarding mix, or if you go directly to the vendors like ourselves, it's important to understand which uh, core technology is inside. So the first question to ask is in relation to documents. Can the technology, the OCR technology, support a wide range of documents uh, and also scripts? So if you're, if you're working in the Arabic world or in China, for example, can it work with the, these scripts, uh, Arabic and Chinese scripts, or we've recently added Bengali script uh, for Bangladesh, for example. Uh, does the technology have this scalability inside to cover these future use cases? Uh, secondly, do they have liveness detection and has it been evaluated by an independent lab? Uh, there are a couple of more labs emerging, but currently I would say IBEDA is the one which has taken the, the, the initiative on this and is doing the most extensive testing. Uh, thirdly, has their facial biometric algorithm been submitted to NIST uh, for the facial recognition vendor test? If it has, just uh, have a look at the report, have a look at how it measures and make sure that there's nothing there that would make you uh, doubt the security of the algorithm. And number four, and probably more importantly than all, than, than all the other ones, is uh, independent testing is one thing. Um, marketing pitches and, and presentations are certainly another thing. But the most important thing you can do is get your hands on two or three different types of this technology and test it, test it, test it on your own data, specific to your own use case, and choose the, the, uh, the, the vendor with the, with the results which match exactly what you're trying to do in your use case. So that's uh, more or less it from me. Uh, if you'd like to discuss this more, of course, feel free to reach out to me by email or via LinkedIn, Donald Green. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take those uh, right now. Perfect. No, a big thank you to you there, Donald. It's uh, thank you for obviously taking the time out to present. But I think that presentation was a uh, a great informatic uh, presentation with a lot of information on how how you work there at Innovatrix. And um, just something that you did mention just at the back end of your presentation regarding the algorithms. Um, so we do have a few questions, of course, but just for the flow, I think I'll go for this one first. Um, so, uh, are your algorithms able to read different scripts besides Latin and Cyrillic? I know you mentioned about uh, about a few there. Uh, are there any limitations in reading international IDs, or can you train your algorithm for any kind of ID also? Yeah, so currently we've trained our algorithm, of course, initially on, on Latin script. Uh, then, due to the needs of a customer, we trained it on the Cyrillic script with some uh, adaptations for the Kazakhstan version of Cyrillic. Uh, more recently, we've uh, trained it for the Arabic script. So Arabic with all of the different uh, ligatures and everything else that comes with it. And uh, the, the one we've released last week is Bengali script for Bangladesh. Um, we're also looking at traditional Chinese. Uh, basically, I would say it's driven by the needs of our customers. Um, theoretically, it's possible. Uh, all we would need is enough data and we would give it to our image processing team to train. Uh, and do some iterations and testing and those kind of things. But certainly I don't think there's any script that I would say is, is definitely off limits for us. We're, we're happy to look at, it, look at and consider training anything. Yeah, yeah, it's almost a universal thing that you can just adapt it to the specific uh, script. Yeah. Great, no, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, Carolina Klinger, uh, she asks, how, to, how do you convince FEX compliance team or security team that passive liveness is more secure than active one? Well, I think, I think the data is quite conclusive on this. Um, I can understand where the question is coming from because with active liveless, you kind of know what's happening. You know that somebody's doing something and uh, their, their eyes are being uh, followed by an algorithm or whatever it is. So it's very difficult to explain 
what passive liveness is actually doing because it's, it's essentially a, a convolutional neural network. It's not doing a specific number of things. It's making decisions based on its own learning. Um, the, the best way I could convince you is say, uh, if, if you'd like to test uh, active liveness and passive liveness on a data set of spoofing attacks, you'll see for yourself, it's gonna be uh, orders of magnitude better to use uh, passive liveness. And again, there is the independent benchmarking from iBeta to back that up. Great, thank you very much. And please do let us know, Carolina, if there is any sort of uh, follow-up with that. Um, so uh, someone asked anonymously, uh, do you think that the pandemic has changed the way people think about digital identity? Absolutely. Um, it, it's probably accelerated trends that were already there. I think that banking was moving that way anyway, not just banking, but let's say onboarding in general was moving that way. Um, but there's no doubt that the COVID pandemic has accelerated that. I read a stat that uh, in Germany, 75% uh, of people who opened accounts last year did so remotely. Uh, and with respect, uh, I think we've seen the mo mo most innovation before COVID was coming from outside of Europe. So for 75% for of people in Germany, and this is an Accenture survey, uh, to open accounts using digital channels tells me there's a seismic shift. And I think what's also important is that the shift is here to stay, it's not going back. And the banks or institutions, or whether it's even a, a, a community application or whatever it might be, any organization with a KYC responsibility, which isn't doing some sort of digital onboarding and isn't doing it securely, is first of all missing a trick and second of all gonna be left behind. Great, no, thank you very much. And please uh, do let us know if there is a follow-up for that also. Um, so yes, I do think uh, there is one remaining question left. I can't see any more, but I think it's a really good question to finish on. Um, so are there any specific technical requirements when adapting your solutions? Well, not, not really, I would say, uh, apart from having, of course, an infrastructure. So uh, whether it's servers or a cloud environment that you would need to have, then the, 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 the technology basically runs inside uh, some sort of, some sort of uh, server, whether it's a virtual server or a real server. So space is one. Um, we have an integration team who works with our, with our partners to integrate the, the, the technology. I would say there is some, uh, let's say, technical expertise needed on the partner side. Uh, to be able to take our, our technology and work with our integration team to actually put this into, into operation. We don't offer it per se as a service, like a software as a service, like a click and play. Um, but there's no like exceptional requirements needed. Uh, if, if the person who asked that would like to specify what they mean in more detail, I'd be happy to answer. But in general, there's no real strict requirements for what's actually needed. Yeah. Yeah, no, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, yeah, please, the person who asked that, please, uh, if uh, you know there is some sort of additional information you are wanting there, please do let us know ASAP. Um, I will give that just another minute, just in case, as uh, Yali Wu from Nordea has actually asked a, another question. Um, so Yali actually asked, data privacy is a hot potato, especially in banking as we work in trust business. When processing biometric and do document data, how do you ensure the confidentiality of that data? Uh, the, the easy way to answer it is saying we don't process it ourselves. Um, we, we've, we've kind of stayed away from becoming the data processor. We've uh, deliberately not provided this as a service that we would uh, process all the data. What we do is we uh, get our components together in what we call this digital onboarding toolkit. Uh, we work with our partners, if it's, for example, a bank, we work with them to integrate it into their, uh, their infrastructure, into their applications, and all of the responsibility for actually managing the data, managing the privacy, and those kind of things remains with the bank. And we found that, the, the, that that's the preferred approach rather than organizations, let's say, taking a bit of a gamble and putting the processing of their data in the hands of another entity. Great. No, thank you very much. And thank you, Ali, for the question. Um, I'll just see if anyone has updated. Okay, yeah, so there is no, uh, no other questions there, Donald. So I want to give you a huge thank you for joining us today and presenting your topic. Uh, it was definitely a very informative uh, presentation. And of course, we can see uh, the amount of questions that were asked that people definitely are interested. Um, of course, guys, if you guys and girls, sorry, if you are interested, uh, please do contact Donald directly or even jump over to the sponsors booth. Uh, you can contact Donald through the platform, 
but you can also contact him, as he mentioned, through his email or through LinkedIn. But of course, his team will be at the sponsors booth. So please, please, please do go speak to them there as well. And of course, have a look around that sponsors booth for Innovatrix, as they do, as I've said uh, previously, some really good innovations there. Um, but other than that, Donald, I want to give you a, you know, a big thank you again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Liam. Great, greatly appreciate it. Take care. No problem. Take care. Bye. Great. So, yes, so we are at the end of day one now for the third annual client onboarding for banking and financial institutions. Uh, so, of course, good evening to you all. Uh, we have, of course, reached the last part of the day. I would like to give a massive thank you to all of our speakers and sponsor speakers throughout the day. Uh, they've brought some amazing thoughts and knowledge to the event, I believe, have enabled lots of critical thinking in the areas of onboarding, digital identity, and similar areas. So I do hope that you have all found it as informative and knowledgeable as me. Uh, of course, we will be carrying on again tomorrow at 8.50 a.m. Central European time, just with a brief uh, introduction to day two with myself. And then we will continue the day with our first speaker at 9 a.m. with Jacques Dantema from ING Wholesale Banking, who is the, uh, the CEO of Co-op ID there. Uh, so he will be speaking on ING's areas of KYC and what he and his team have implemented to create success. Um, so, of course, until then, uh, I you know, very much hope you guys stay safe, stay well, and, of course, we will see you in the morning. And just one more thing, just a big, big, big thank you to our sponsors of the day, so that being Ruben from Onfido, Tom from Risk Screen, uh, Raheem from OneSpan, and, of course, Donald from Innovatrix. Uh, so a big thank you to all of them and, of course, all our speakers, but, of course, to yourselves as well for joining us and, of course, engaging and, you know, asking those questions. So a big thank you. I hope you all have a good evening and I will see you bright and early tomorrow.